In 2010, Germany's premium car maker Daimler and the French Japanese car group Renault Nissan Alliance joined forces. The companies announced several projects focused around increasing efficiency in Europe. But the partnership quickly took on a global scope and is now the most productive cross cultural and international collaboration in the automotive industry. The Mercedes Citan, jointly developed and manufactured by Renault and on sale since 2012, the first vehicle resulting from the cooperation. Next came co-developed, fuel-efficient, small diesel powertrains for the Mercedes-Benz A and B class produced by Renault. At the same time, Daimler began adapting its four-cylinder diesel engine and seven-speed automatic gearbox for the Infiniti Q50, which has been on sale since fall 2013. In 2014, Daimler and Renault begin selling the next-generation Smart and Twingo city cars developed together on a shared platform. Daimler and Renault are also working on a direct-injection turbocharged small gasoline engine family. First application of the engines are expected in vehicles from 2016 onwards. 2015 marks the debut of the Infiniti Q30, leveraging the Mercedes-Benz front-wheel drive architecture. The cooperation has also expanded in the commercial vehicle business in Japan. The project portfolio between Daimler and Renault-Nissan keeps growing. The two companies have only one rule. Consider all win-win projects that drive customer value while maintaining clear brand differentiation. Well, hello, everyone. I'm Rachel Conrad, Global Director of Communications at the Renault-Nissan Alliance. And first, I'd like to welcome everyone to this news conference with Renault-Nissan CEO and Chairman Carlos Ghosn and Dieter Zetsche, Chairman of the Board of Management of Daimler AG and Head of Mercedes-Benz Cars. We have journalists from around the world who are watching by live streaming video, and we have more than 100 people watching us live in Mexico. In just a few seconds, the leaders of Daimler and Renault-Nissan will announce the day's big news. After that, my colleague at Daimler, Communications Vice President Jorg Hova, will moderate a question and answer session with both executives. We will start with some questions from Mexico City. We will then take questions by email from journalists watching this by the live stream. As a reminder, please ask all of your questions in English and use this special opportunity with our highest ranking executives to ask your most strategic big picture questions. Thank you. And now let's hear from Dieter Zetsche, followed by Carlos Ghosn. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish all of you in Mexico a good morning, in Europe a good afternoon, and in Japan a good evening. If anyone needed more evidence that the partnership between Daimler and Renault-Nissan is truly global, then this virtual press conference is the final proof. Wherever you may be, we are happy that you're attending, because we've got some important news for you. As many of you know, our companies can now look back on several years of increasing cooperation. Back in 2010, we began with just a handful of projects. Then we intensified our partnership step by step in areas of mutual benefit. Today, we have a wide range of successful joint projects. For example, we collaborate on engines and transmissions. We started the cross supply of light duty trucks and vans and we joined forces in the field of fuel cell technology. Right now, one of our most complex tasks so far is on the final lap, the development of a new Smart and Twingo vehicle. In just a few weeks, we'll celebrate the Smart World premiere. We can hardly wait for it. Today, we're holding this web conference to announce our biggest project yet. 
It takes our partnership to the next level. Daimler and Nissan will cooperate on premium compact cars. Together, we will develop a new generation of compact models for both Mercedes-Benz and Infiniti. And we will produce these cars in a common plant in Aquascalientes in central Mexico. Let me give you some numbers to describe the scale of this undertaking. Together, we will invest about 1 billion euros in the new plant. In total, we will create nearly 5,700 jobs. When fully ramped up, the new plant will have an annual capacity of 300,000 vehicles. Construction of the plant will begin next year. Production of Infinity vehicles will begin in 2017, and the first Mercedes will roll off the assembly line in 2018. We're teaming up in this venture because it offers two advantages that are key to grow profitably in the compact segment. First, we'll share development costs. Second, our combined production will be more efficient. That means we are leveraging synergies while our vehicles will keep their completely independent characters. Infinity will stay infinity, and a Mercedes is and will remain a Mercedes. So why did we choose Mexico as our production site? The NAFTA region is extremely important to both of us. The US is the single biggest market for Mercedes-Benz, as well as for Infinity. We anticipate demand for our compacts will continue to climb in North America. The plant in Aquascalientes will help us to serve this demand faster and more flexibly. Time already has three truck plants and a bus plant in Mexico. So we know the production location very well and have good experience there. We'll have access to the highly developed network of suppliers that are located in Mexico. What's more, Nissan already has its own production in Acoscalientes, which is a big advantage in terms of logistics and infrastructure. Finally, in addition to belonging to NAFTA, Mexico is also part of the EU-Mexico and Mercosur free trade areas. So we chose Aquascalientes for good reason, much as we chose Renault Nissan as our partner. Both sides bring significant strengths to this project. Nissan is highly efficient and global in production, and for 120 years, Daimler has stood for state-of-the-art German engineering and absolutely premium quality. I believe that's a very promising combination. With that, I'll hand it over to Carlos Gohn, who will tell you more about the project. Carlos? Thank you, Dieter, and good day from Paris. This is by far the most significant project we have taken on in our cooperation with Daimler. When we began this cooperation four years ago, we were focused on Europe particularly, and we had three potential specific projects. Today, we have more than 10 projects, and we are working on many more than that. Yesterday, we celebrated the start of production at our new Infinity Deckard powertrain plant in the U.S., uh, particularly in the state of Tennessee. That plant will build a two-liter turbocharged four-cylinder engine for the Infiniti Q50 sports sedan and the Mercedes-Benz C-Class. Today, we are expanding further with two closely related items, the joint development of modules for the Infiniti and Mercedes next generation compact premium vehicles and the production of those vehicles at our plant in Aguascalientes. And Aguascalientes is the first production location we are announcing. Infiniti and Mercedes will also produce jointly developed vehicles independently at separate plants on three continents. The scope of this project shows how our collaboration has become truly global in scope. Why are we working more and more closely together? First, this helps us achieve our objectives in the premium segment. Infinity's goal is to capture 10% of the global premium vehicle market. To do so, we need to expand our model range, particularly in the growing compact premium segment. By partnering with Daimler on development and production costs, Infinity will move faster and achieve greater economies of scale. Ultimately, this project is about being competitive with the best in class. Infinity and Mercedes-Benz engineers will collaborate 
at every stage of development from advanced engineering, design, to production. That will ensure these vehicles are distinctive in design, features, and specifications. Ultimately, the efficiency we generate in our development and production will translate into higher value cars for our respective customers. Today, both Dieter and I are even more optimistic about the future of our cooperation. We share a common mindset that everything is on the table. We have encouraged our teams to look at every idea and proposal to see how they can make it work to benefit both companies. Most importantly, our teams have developed respect for each other and have embraced a productive spirit of cooperation. By bringing their ample skills to the table, both teams have benefited and learned from one another. I'd like to conclude with a few words about our operations in Mexico. In 1966, Mexico became the first country to manufacture Nissan cars outside of Japan when it inaugurated the Cuernavaca plant. Nissan launched the Aguascalientes plant in 1992 with significant expansions just in the many years following it, and particularly in the past year. In November, Nissan opened the first phase of a $2 billion manufacturing complex in Aguascalientes. Aguascalientes is one of our best, most efficient plants with a highly skilled and productive workforce that has a long track record of top-level performance. From Cuernavaca to Aguascalientes, Nissan's Mexican industrial footprint now consists of three assembly plants with a capacity of more than 850,000 vehicles annually when fully ramped up. And the news today adds an additional 300,000 units of annual production capacity at full ramp up. That means we will have an annual production capacity of more than 1.1 million vehicles in Mexico by 2020. We know our workforce is capable of producing top quality vehicles in every segment of the market. Our decision to select this site reflects that confidence. With that, let's open it up to questions, starting, if I understand, with the journalists in Mexico City and then taking questions virtually as they come in. Thank you, Carlos Gohn, and thank you, Dieter Zetsche. Ladies and gentlemen, it's now time for your questions. We will start with two questions from Mexico City. We will then take questions by email from journalists watching our press conference by live stream. Again, please ask all your questions in English only. When asking your question, kindly give us your name and the medium you are presenting. And now to Mexico and Herman Morfin, please, in Mexico City. Yes, George, thank you. Thank you for your introduction. We have a question here. Please proceed. Hi, uh, Victor Aleman, Grupo Reforma. Uh, this question is for both gentlemen. Uh, in, in the next uh, four years, in the four years of your alliance, what have been the main benefits for both companies? Uh, can we expect further common module family vehicles and more important, uh, more Mexican production? Okay, let's start with Carlos Cohn, please answering the question? Well, I, I, I think, frankly, I think uh, in, for Mexico, we're going to be concentrating for the next four years. For uh, next four years mean that we're going from uh, 2014 to 2018. We're going to be concentrating first into uh, building the plant. We're going to be concentrating into preparing the plant for high quality production, and then we're going to ramping it up. So uh, I think it would be premature today to say uh, we're going to have more projects going on in Mexico for the next four years. Now, if you expand and if you eliminate the four years and you say in the future, um, uh, as you know, Mexico is, is a very big operation for, for Nissan. You heard from Dieter that he also have high uh, value for uh, the Mexican workforce and the Mexican productivity. So there is no obstacle to how much we can achieve together in Mexico, even though uh, I don't think today we have any specific project. You asked uh, for our benefits from the last four years. Uh, I think they are definitely significant on both sides. When I talk about uh, Mercedes and Daimler, 
uh, we clearly see the benefits of the small displacement four cylinder engines. Uh, we see the benefit of the cooperation with diesel engines and larger engines, as it was um, mentioned before, uh, coming from Mercedes and going uh, to Infinity. Uh, we have um, good success with the Citan in the marketplace. We are very excited about the launch of uh, the new smart generation in a few um, weeks from now, which is, as we mentioned as well, their common project together uh, with the Twingo. Uh, so there are many, many areas where already today are benefiting from the cooperation, and what we are announcing today certainly is another big step going forward, and I would totally agree with Carlos announcing this big uh, 300,000 capacity uh, planned today, um, I think it's premature to discuss the next extension afterwards. Next question from Mexico City, please. Okay. Hi, I'm Oscar Sanabria from Auto Explorer. My question will be regarding technology and uh, the future of mobility due to the fact that a lot of activity has been uh, showing up uh, here in Mexico with Nissan and electric vehicles. And is there any plan or projections that Mexico will eventually turn in this plant or uh, all the activities together uh, an important technology developer for North America or other countries in, in, in the continent in America? Thank you. We start with Dida and then Carlos. Well, again, that's certainly a potential going forward. At that point of time, uh, we are planning uh, vehicles with combustion engines uh, for Mexico and for the market, which are supplied from Mexico. Um, but as has been mentioned before, there's a very well-developed supplier base in Mexico. Um, there's a lot of uh, strength uh, in this country. So this is certainly an opportunity going forward, but no specific plans at that point of time. Carlos, go on, please. Yeah, I, I would say that uh, we, we don't have uh, Mexican plans and U.S. plans. Uh, we don't have a Mexican technical center and the U.S. technical center. In fact, we have North American plans and we have North American technical center, some of it based in Mexico and some of it based in the United States, which means that our Mexican plans today work uh, as much, if not more, for the U.S. market than they work for Mexico. And the technical center we have also in Mexico is collaborating very, uh, uh, you know, intimately with the technical center we have in the United States. And frankly, there is no distinction between both of them. It's one team in two different, uh, in two different countries. So to answer your questions, yes, we're going to have a lot of technological development. Yes, we're going to have a lot of products coming. Uh, uh, and uh, the, the allocation of the project, that means is, is this part going to be done in Mexico or in the United States, in the technical center of Mexico or in the United States, is much more in function of the availability of, you know, where do we have uh, available capacity uh, in order to do it. So, yes, there are going to be more and more technological development in the North American continent, and this technological development will take place, I would say, in a balanced way, between Mexico and the United States. So you can expect it. So the next question I take from the internet, it's um, a question from Jennifer Bayen, ARD German Television, to Dieter Zetsche. Mr. Zetsche, how will this new project affect your manufacturing base in Stuttgart? Um, certainly only in a positive way. Uh, with this plant in North America, we'll have better access to the growing demand in North America, and therefore we'll be able to sell more vehicles. As uh, obviously, uh, with a high degree of localization, still not all parts will come from North America. There will always be delivery coming from uh, Germany, and therefore the German plants will benefit from this expansion as well. Next question comes from Akito Tanaka from Nikkei, goes to Mr. Gohn. Mr. Gohn, is there any plan to use a common module family platform with Daimler? Uh, well, you know, we, 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 I mean, we have been saying, yes, we, we, will, uh, we will be working uh, together. Uh, so we are sharing a lot of, 
modules and we are sharing a lot of technology. But at the same time, I think as uh, Dieter mentioned it, uh, we, we, uh, we, we are going to come with cars with completely different identities and different taste corresponding to very different consumer. Uh, we, we mentioned many times that uh, one of the reasons for which our collaboration with Daimler is so strong is because in all our analysis, everything we're doing, the cross-shopping between Daimler and any one of the brands of the alliance is very, very small, which means that in a certain way, the fact that we have very distinct customer base, that we have uh, completely differentiated products is making this cooperation much easier. But yes, there is a lot of development in terms of technology, and there is a lot of things developed in common, particularly things which are not visible in a certain way to the, to the consumers. Next question goes to both CEOs. It's from Ed Taylor from Reuters English News Service. Um, will the cars be built on the MFA architecture, and could we also see Nissan vehicles both built in Rastatt or at a Mercedes factory somewhere in Europe? We'll start with Dieter and go on with Carlos. Um, as we know, and as has been shown in the little video clip uh, in the beginning, there's already uh, one Infinity vehicle uh, which uh, is starting from the current MFA architecture. Um, of course, when we talk about the next generation, uh, we will use as much as makes sense from the current architecture to develop the new architecture. In this sense, uh, there is some MFA foundation, but uh, this is a co-development. We're going for a new generation and we're developing that together, and therefore uh, it's not really, doesn't mean a lot whether we call that uh, next MFA or whatever. It's our mutual development to come up with a new fantastic uh, compact car architecture which serves uh, to offer great vehicles for Infiniti and for Mercedes. Alos? Yeah, well, uh, uh, maybe uh, first I obviously agree completely with what uh, Dieter said. Uh, you asked also a question about uh, the potential of having uh, Infinity cars or Nissan cars in, in other plants, uh, we never envision it, not because it's a taboo subject, it's just because there is no need. Uh, and uh, as uh, we mentioned many times with Dieter, uh, every time there is a need from uh, uh, one company, we, we analyze it uh, very clearly. And if we can bring a solution which is a win-win for both company, we, uh, uh, we then uh, uh, decide to, to, to move on. But, but so far, this perspective uh, did not present itself uh, neither from uh, Nissan nor from other partners in uh, in this uh, in this partnership. Next question is from Doran Levin from Fortune.com to Carlos Gorn. Who will manage the factory in Aguas Calientes? Uh, you know, we we agreed uh, with Dieter. Obviously, uh, uh, we, we're going to have a, uh, a a board of uh, of directors and. Uh, what we agreed is the, the CEO uh, of this company, which is basically is going to be the plant manager, um, is going to be uh, from Nissan, uh, but he will be surrounded with the CFO and the CQO. CQO is the chief quality officer, and the CFO is the chief financial officer nominated by Daimler. This is the initial scheme, but then uh, we can move the scheme. That means it's, uh, it is totally possible that after a few years, well, the CEO will become from Daimler, and other job can be nominated by Nissan. And we started with the CEO from Nissan because, as you know, Aguas Calientes today is a big production center of Nissan, um, and um, it, we thought that it would be much better for building the plant and ramping up the plant to start with somebody who knows very well the area and is familiar with uh, the complex of Nissan in Aguas Calientes. Ultimately, it shouldn't mean a lot uh, who comes from whom, but we just want to have the best people operating this plan, and that's what we, are, uh, we will be striving towards. Next question is from Annika Graf from German Press Agency to Dieter Zetsche. Which models will Daimler produce in Mexico, Dieter? Well, obviously, we are talking about the next generation compact cars. Um, and I think it's uh, too early as we're talking the first vehicle seeing the market in 2018, too early uh, to talk about the specifics of these future models. Okay, I would like to go over again to Mexico City, to Herman, 
Herman, do you have new questions yes, yes. there? Yes, we have additional questions here. So we will start with, with a question here, with a gentleman there. Okay, Blanca. Hi, my name is Marza Raval. I'm from Grupo Reforma. The question is for both, and it is, Mexico is the fourth largest, largest sorry, exporter in the world. Are you trying to boost the arrives in the next few years at a higher position? I mean increasing, I guess. See Mexico yeah. uh, so who do you want me to, who do you want to answer, George? Carlos, I would prefer you to start. We have okay, I will I will start. Uh, no, no problem. Uh, let, let me let me tell you, we are very bullish on Mexico. We are very bullish on Mexico. Not only we are very bullish on Mexico because of the present performance in Mexico, and obviously Nissan has a lot of reasons to be bullish on Mexico. We are the number one car brand in Mexico. Uh, uh, six out of the 10 most sold cars in Mexico are from Nissan. Uh, we have some of our best plants today based in Mexico. So there are a lot of things uh, which we, we're obviously by far the leader on the market with 25% market share, etc. So uh, we are very bullish on Mexico, not only because of the present performance, but because also when we take a look we see what are the prospects of Mexico. You take even outside analyst and outside consultant. I just want to nominate a recent study made by Boston Consulting Group saying, trying to project competitiveness of the different countries for the next 10 years. Well, it's interesting that the two countries coming at the top level are Mexico and the United States. So all of this is making us really uh, wanting Mexico to play even a bigger role uh, not only as a market, but also as a base for export. Base for export north through the United States and Canada, but also base of export south to the rest of Central and South America. So without any doubt, we are very bullish on Mexico. And you're going to see, uh, I mean, we are not only exporting from Mexico, because again, I want to repeat that we have the intention to remain the number one brand in Mexico. But uh, it would be fair to say that a lot of capacity will be built for Nissan. This is one example that we share with, uh, with Daimler uh, in order to use the competitiveness of Mexico to the benefit of our brands. So um, as I mentioned before, that with the plant in NAFTA, we will have better access to the U.S. market and uh, accomplish uh, higher sales there. This, of course, applies even more so for Mexico, where we definitely will improve our market position through the local production. But at the same time, just as Carlos said uh, for Nissan, uh, we will use this location for exports as well. Uh, and there again, the Mexican situation with special trade agreements, including between Mexico and Europe, is very beneficial, uh, which allows us at a preferential uh, situation to export vehicles to Europe, but to other places as well, which will happen. So we try another question from Mexico City, please. Yes, Joel, please. Buenos días. Miguel Ángel Silva de la revista Automotores. Señor Gons, señor Dieter, este proyecto, con this project uh, estimates a new investment about the supplier bases, but uh, Daimler and uh, Nissan. And what is the uh, reason about no uh, Daimler no invest in exclusively in a particular plant? Please. Start with Dieter. Well, as far as the suppliers are concerned, it's clear when we um, are establishing a capacity for 300,000 vehicles in Mexico and we are shooting for very high local content. Obviously, there's uh, lots of benefit for the Mexican supplier base and uh, we will see significant investment and employment in Mexican um, supply companies being a consequence of uh, our decision today. Um, to your second part of the question, um, as we mentioned before, uh, working together means um, sharing development costs, means uh, creating uh, opportunities of uh, scale position where by adding 
um, volume, the suppliers can more efficiently uh, develop parts for us. Uh, all of these are reasons why we are on the one hand uh, significantly benefiting both of us to jointly operating this plant, but at the same time, as it was mentioned various times as well, uh, the result will be products which are totally different and uh, totally uh, consistent with the different brand identities uh, which are uh, the most uh, important assets uh, in our groups, our brands. Uh, and therefore, there is a real win-win for the customer for both of our companies. Carlos, something to add? Uh, no, I, I obviously uh, share exactly what, uh, what Dieter has said. This is going to be good news for the suppliers. And we have the intention uh, to really totally uh, or localize as much as it makes sense in Mexico, uh, which is going to be good news, obviously, for employment uh, in, the, in the state. We want to totally benefit from the pro-business and competitive environment that exists in the state of Aguas Calientes. Uh, and here I would like uh, really to salute all the efforts made by Governor Lozano uh, de la Torre to really make uh, Aguas Calientes even more attractive than it was uh, in, the, in the past for us. So we're very confident. Next question comes from William Boston, Wall Street Journal. And the question goes to both. If the alliance is so successful, what speaks against a full-blown merger to create create even greater scale and efficiency? I would prefer Carlos to start and then Dieter. Well, I don't think, I don't think that a uh, merger uh, make company better, frankly. I, I think because with this logic, you would say, why Renault Nissan, which have been working together for 15 years uh, in a way which is very successful, which produced so much synergies, did not merge? Uh, well, frankly, because we didn't feel the need uh, to blur the identity of the brands and blur the specific culture of the company. And we didn't think there was any particular advantage. And this was not, in my opinion, uh, an obstacle to develop uh, synergies. So if already you're saying this for Renault Nissan, which have a much uh, bigger relationship and intimacy into the work, uh, you can imagine that with Daimler, which is a completely different culture, and the company, which is completely in a, comp in a, completing in a, a completely different area, I think the fact that being separate entity is absolutely not obstacle to developing together and sharing what makes sense. So uh, I, I don't think there is any obligation here. I would go so far to say the cooperation is so successful because it is not the result of a merger and things we are doing together, we are not doing together because we have to, because we are a merged entity, but because we want to, because these projects make sin sense for all parties involved. Uh, so I think we have a perfect uh, setup uh, to create these very successful projects together. Next question is from Lindsay Chappelle from Automotive News. Goes first to Carlos. Where will the engines and transmissions for these vehicles come from? Well, uh, we, uh, we, we think that most of them will come from the NAFTA region. So it's going to be between uh, Mexico and the United States. Huh? Uh, we, we obviously, there is still a lot of work to be done here. But uh, again, uh, for us, uh, we want to be as localized as possible. Uh, I can tell you that means the, 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 the NAFTA uh, localization rate, rate will be very high. Next question is from Harry Pretzlaff, Stuttgarter Zeitung here in Germany. And he asks, will the Infinity and Mercedes cars be produced on the same production line? And how big is the capacity for the Mercedes cars? Uh, to come, come up with um, ideal volumes per line, uh, we need two lines to uh, create the volume of 300,000 units. And of course, naturally, it makes sense uh, to uh, use the one line for um, Mercedes uh, cars and the other one for Infinity cars, but both lines will have the capability uh, to assemble the vehicles of the other brand, and therefore there very well can be a situation in the future where it makes sense uh, to have mixed production on either one of the two lines. The original, the early, the startup setup uh, is 
per line, the brand separated. Next question from Lindsay Chappell again goes um, to Carlos. Did we understand you right to say that the partners will additionally produce these vehicles independently on other continents? Yes. Okay, clear answer. <laughs> Another one from Stuttgart. Mr. Zetsche, which parts and components will be shared between Infinity and Mercedes, and which won't? Well, specifically, we are not uh, at the end of the development and the end of writing the spec book, but we are well advanced. So in most cases, it is defined. Uh, but now not to give you a list of 70 components uh, in, in different uh, buckets. Uh, the general definition is that uh, what is functional for the vehicle is shared and what is visible to the customer is separated. That is the basic uh, definition we are following. There is another question from Florian Chopin, L'Auto Journal de France. He asked both, why did you choose a new platform for the next compact car for Infiniti Mercedes and not the recent CHF3 of the Alliance Renault Nissan? I would prefer Carlos to start with. Well, I, I, uh, let me answer this question because, in fact, we have much higher specification on the cars that are that we are developing together so so we we uh, did not want to be limited uh, in terms of specification by existing platforms that's the main reasons for which we're going for a specific and new platform agreed okay then we try again uh, questions from mexico city please yes we have a question here please proceed Good morning, my name is Marcos Martinez from Autobel Mexico magazine. I have a question for Mr. Gomes. Today we have an important announce talking about production, but do you have plans to development center in Mexico talking in terms of design or maybe engineering and not just to see Mexico as a producer, maybe as a producer of knowledge? Thank you. I would just give well, this question uh, you know, to Carlos. Uh, uh, it would be, uh, you, we have already, uh, you know, engineers in Mexico and we have a, a, a technical center in Mexico. We, we don't feature it too much because in a certain way, it's an expansion of our technical center, which is based in the United States. In fact, we have been developing and hiring a lot of engineers uh, which are working on car development on top, obviously, of all the process engineers which are based in our plants. So, but if your reference is about advanced engineering, which means people working on advanced technology and not only development of cars, for the moment, most of our advanced engineering, when we're talking about Nissan, is based in Japan. It's not because we, we, we don't want to do it somewhere else. It's, it's a question of priority. We, we give priority to the car development, component development, localization in uh, the, the countries. Um, advanced engineering is much more concentrated in one specific country, but even with this, we have a lot of collaboration going on with labs, with universities. Uh, we have offices opening up in California in Silicon Valley. Uh, so uh, you can see that with the time, uh, what we have done in uh, car development will expand to advanced engineering. But this is the second phase, and this is less urgent than what we are focusing on today. So next question from Mexico, please. Yes. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jorge Bonilla from Motorblog. I have a question regarding the models that are going to be produced for Mercedes in Aguascalientes. We know for sure that Infiniti Q30 is going to be the first one. But what about Mercedes? It's just going to start with the A-Class hatchback. Uh, are we going to have all the families, CLA class, GLA class? And also for Mr. Ghosn, a few, years, a few years back in Mexico City, there was an announcement made that a new vehicle for Renault was going to be produced in Aguascalientes. Is there any update about it? Thank you. So we start with Dida this time. The next generation of compact cars for Mercedes uh, will have uh, more family members, if you want, than the current one. And uh, it is not a given that all five um, 
members of this family will be present in the next generation as well, and obviously there will be additional ones. Uh, so once again, I ask for your understanding that at that point of time, we do not want to announce the specific vehicles uh, being launched uh, in Mexico in four years from now. Carlos? Yeah, about, uh, about the production of a Renault car, uh, yes, there have been a lot of studies about uh, production of Renault car in Mexico. Uh, they never came to a positive conclusion. Uh, uh, it doesn't mean that they won't in the future, but for the moment, uh, there is no decision in this sense. We need also to admit on the fact that today our capacities in Mexico are fully used. Uh, we are running the plants at more than 6,000 hours a year, which means practically full capacity on, on many shifts. And uh, we are more into the situation of adding more capacity to answer the demand on uh, the Nissan cars than to bring other brands uh, to Mexico. But again, uh, this may uh, still be something uh, to be considered in the future. Okay, next question is from Jack Ewing, New York Times, goes to Dieter Zetsche. Did you look at any other possible sites for this investment? Did you look at any sites in Canada or the US? Of course, when you want to make a responsible um, decision, uh, you have to look for alternatives. And that's, of course, what we did here as well. Uh, first of all, discussing what is the right continent to go for, and this was very much defined by the market needs and the growth potential in, in uh, North America, obviously. But then for North America, where's the best location there? Um, we tell you what location won, obviously. We would prefer not to tell you which locations did not win, because that's a less uh, nice uh, piece of information. Uh, so uh, there were good uh, opportunities, but obviously Aquas Calientes uh, turned out to be the best one. Next question is from Paul Eisenstein, the Detroit Bureau, goes to both gentlemen. How do you avoid having an overlap of competing products to come from the new plant? If you go first, Carlos. Uh, well, you know, uh, so far, as I told you, cross-shopping between Infinity and Mercedes is near zero. So, frankly, I, I don't think we have to worry about it today. Uh, so, and I think also uh, our designers are not the same. Uh, uh, the product planners are not the same. Uh, we're not addressing the same customer base. Uh, so uh, uh, there is nothing we should worry about, at least from our side, uh, today. Uh, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't have be cautious. We, we have to be cautious. But there is no reason for the moment to be particularly preoccupied. If there were considerable risk, our sales organizations on both sides would uh, raise their hands and um, become concerned. Uh, none of that is happening, so I only can 100% confirm what Carlos just said. Our next question is from Chris Wright of Bloomberg. He says, what savings do you expect from the corporation compared with doing it alone? Would we'll start with Dida. I mean, uh, I hope uh, you accept that I don't give you specific numbers, but uh, when I said before uh, we are sharing development cost, obviously uh, that means basically that uh, each side has half the, the effort on that side. Uh, then of course we get benefits from volume bundling in um, giving contracts to our suppliers. Uh, we have the benefits of running a joint plan where you need once the infrastructure, once the training of the people and all of that. So there are many areas where substantial savings come together and that's a reason why we do it together. Carlos? Uh, frankly, there is nothing to be added. Uh, uh, Dieter covered everything. That means, uh, as he said, you know, uh, saving in manufacturing, saving in uh, development, saving in purchasing costs, uh, and, and also saving in time. We're going to move much faster by joining forces. So uh, for us, it's an obvious decision. Obviously, of course, the investment is shared as well. Um, because we have a very tight, tight schedule for both CEOs, we have a last question now from the system. It's from Akito Tanaka from Nikkei from Japan. Um, he asked both gentlemen, would you consider similar production cooperation outside of Mexico in any other country. Maybe Carlos starts first. Uh, without any doubt. We, we said from the beginning, 
we, we always said we have no obligation to work together, but we are working together because it makes sense for both companies. So as long as we are looking together at projects that make sense uh, to share, we will do it. So would we do something uh, like this outside Mexico? Without any doubt. But it has, it's not out of principle, it's out of need and interest. Quite frankly, uh, on that basis, when you would have asked me four years ago when we started this uh, strategic cooperation, uh, at what, what stage we would be in 2014, I never would have predicted uh, such a broad and intense uh, scope of cooperation as we have reached today, and therefore I'm uh, very cautious on making uh, predictions on the future. I guess uh, we will be surprised as well how many future projects we will find, not knowing about their specifics today. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us today. Our communication teams from the Alliance and from Daimler are at your disposal for further questions. I wish you a very nice day. Thank you very much again, and greetings to Mexico City. Thank you so much.